Hey folks, it's Mike Massey, and yes, I am back with an episode of the Martial Arts Business Podcast after a rather long hiatus. Uh, some of you may know that I, uh, I ran this podcast for a couple of years, several years back. I was uh, probably the first person to um, have a successful podcast in the martial arts industry as a consultant. And uh, now it seems like there are podcasts uh, everywhere you look, but uh, you know I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'll get into that a little bit later in the discussion. But uh, I stopped doing the podcast because it was a bit of a time suck, and uh, also uh, you know I had a lot of other stuff going on. I started writing fiction. My fiction novel uh, writing career took off. It's still doing well, by the way. Um, and I uh, just didn't have time for the podcast anymore. But um, I'm back now. You may also know that. Uh, I uh, have had a, uh, an ongoing battle with uh, lung cancer for the last two years. And so I'm about almost four months post-surgery. Um, we fought the cancer for about a year and a half. Uh, I refused uh, chemo and radiation simply because um, I didn't see any, uh, I couldn't find any, any clinical evidence to uh, basically to, sh to show that I would benefit from it based on the type of cancer I had. I had a very rare form of cancer, like a one in a million cancer. There's less than a thousand cases of this type of cancer every year. Um, as it turns out, that was the right call um, for various reasons that I won't get into. But uh, um, essentially, the type of cancer that I have doesn't respond well to chemo or radiation, and sometimes it can be harmful. So um, surgery is the first line treatment for this type of cancer, and I did have surgery. The surgery was successful. Um, had a wonderful surgical team at MD Anderson. Uh, Dr. Rice and the surgical team over there did an outstanding job uh, with me, and uh, I can't say enough good things about him. And, uh, of course, you know, my specialist and uh, integrative oncologist and so forth um, just had wonderful people taking care of me. So I'm four months out, and I'm doing well. Um, I'm back to training and doing some of the other stuff that I love, albeit with some, uh, you know, understandable, uh, you know, I, I guess you could say, uh, eh, I don't want to, I'll, I'll say challenges. Uh, after you have uh, a lobe of your lung removed, I don't think uh, you're ever going to be quite what you were before, but that doesn't stop me from training, and I'm having a blast uh, being back in training and, and, again, doing some of the things I love, so no complaints there, and, uh, and I'll take this over the alternative, so here I am. I'm back. Now, I'm going to talk about why I'm back, actually. It's not just because of, um, you know, surviving cancer and so forth. I'm going to talk about some other things here in a minute. But uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast is because some of you have been asking for long-form video content. Um, I have been putting out quite a bit more content recently simply because I wanted to let people know that I am back. I am back to coaching and doing some other things. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and some of you asked for long-form video content, and I understand that. I understand why you want that content. I understand it's almost expected of thought leaders these days. Um, anybody who is uh, a so-called influencer in an in industry on social media is expected to put out long-form content. I get that, although, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to um, give my time freely uh, because early on, when I first wrote Small Budget Big Profits back in 2003, that following year, the book kind of took off. It was kind of an underground success. And, you know, after about a year and a half, I found that I was, you know, spending almost more time dealing with customers and giving free advice than I was running my own dojo at the time. And uh, I had to stop it. That's when I started charging for consulting work and so forth. And, you know, that worked out well. But um, I am still very, uh, I do guard my time very closely. And, and now after having survived cancer and, you know, you spend a year and a half waking up every day contemplating your own imminent demise and uh you know things are going to change for you as far as your attitude goes and uh, a couple things did change for me one of them is is that you know i have even less patience for foolish people these days um i suffer fools i've always suffered fools poorly and and now it's i have even less less patience trust me um but the other thing is i have a little bit more empathy for others too um, simply because I know there are a lot of people that are out there that are hurting and that are going through challenges. And so, you know, one of the reasons why I've returned to um, actively coaching in the industry is not just because my health is better, but because I want to help people, as, as I've always wanted to help people. And you can't help everybody for free. You know, I do have to do this as a business because I have to support my family. But um, I'm trying to put as much information out there as I can to uh, help those of you who are, who are struggling. And in many cases, um, struggling needlessly, that's not your fault, but I'm going to talk about that more in a minute too. So, so that's the deal. So you asked for long form video content and here it is. Now, um, I want to talk about, um, what I have coming down the pike. Okay. So I have a few things coming down the pike. 
Um, one of them is I have a new course coming up. Um, it is a, uh, it's kind of a revision of my marketing course, I guess you could say. You know, in, in the digital age, marketing is a moving, it's a moving target. Um, being able to market your school successfully is uh, something that you have to continually work at. You have to continuously update your skills. You have to stay on the forefront of, uh, of uh, trends and, and so forth in the di digital marketing industry because almost everything is digital now. Offline marketing still works to an extent, but um, it's just easier to do digital marketing. And so um, it was time for me to revise and update that course. And I've done it a couple of times, but I just kind of started off from the, the ground up and, and – uh, reshot it, re-recorded it. So that's coming coming down the pike soon. And of course, again, back to coaching, I am opening up more coaching availability. Um, I'm going to make it much easier for people to uh, book coaching sessions with me. Uh, I'm not the type of coach that tries to sell you on a $10,000 or you know, $20,000, $30,000 mastermind coaching package right off the bat. Um, I'd rather meet with somebody one-on-one -on -one and uh, spend 45 minutes with them and find out what their problems are and see if I can't solve the problems initially in that, uh, in that, you know, one hour session or 45 minute session. Um, and if somebody needs extended coaching, I'm available for that as well, but I'm going to make it easier for people to book with me. Although I still have limited time to do coaching every day. Um, I will be more accessible. So that's something you can look forward to. Um, hopefully if, you know, if you're wanting to get coaching from me, um, some people could care less. <laughs> so, that's fine too. Um, and then I have a secret project launching soon. So there's going to be a secret project coming up. Uh, I'm not going to announce it just yet, but we'll be announcing it in future podcast episodes. And by the way, this podcast, you can expect me to drop a new episode about every week now. So I'm going to try to do some uh, interviews and so forth like I've done before, but also change it up and want to make sure that it's not just me that's, you know, doing these talking head videos to you every week. So I, you know, that, that can get boring after a while, no matter how much you think that, um, that I know what I'm talking about. Eventually, you know, you're going to get bored of that. So I'll try to um, schedule some interview host, uh, interview guests and so forth and see how that goes. That seems to have been pretty popular in the past. So now let's talk about the topic for this initial relaunch of the podcast. And that is the state of the industry. And in my opinion, the industry is hurting. And uh, part of that is because, you know, we had the pandemic, a lot of Studio owners didn't recover from the pandemic. Um, it was a disruptive event like nothing we've ever seen. But it's not just that. It isn't just that. Um, while I was sick over the last couple of years, the last 18 months, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about things. And I kind of was preoccupied with my own health at the time, you know, which is understandable. But it doesn't mean that I wasn't still working with people. I was still trying to run my coaching group and do some other things because, you know, bills had to be paid. Um, and I will say that I saw some things that were pretty disturbing during that time, you know. Um, for one, let's just say that the business environment now is probably tougher than it's ever been. Um, I, although there is more opportunity now for various reasons that I will discuss, but, you know, we have... Uh, a recession that we've never come out of since the pandemic. I, mean, I don't care what anybody says, we're still in a recession. Um, inflation is crazy. The, the, you know, your dollars, you know, your money doesn't go near as far as it used to. And, uh, you know, I've seen it everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter what the, you know, the, the media tells you. The indicators are there. The economic indicators are there. Um, you know, gas is sky high. Um, Heating costs are sky high. Electricity has gone up. Um, go to the grocery store. You know, I think we're spending probably 40% more on groceries every month. You know, I, I went to um, the local uh, Home Depot to get some supplies just for doing landscaping because we were selling our old house because we moved in downsize when, when, uh, right before my surgery. You know, for various reasons, so I wouldn't have to climb stairs after getting part of my lawn removed and stuff like that. And you know, a, a simple piece of metal lawn edging that I used to pay like eight, 10 bucks for is now like two and a half times the price. It's like $24 for one piece or something like that. It's just insane. And, uh, you know, in our industry, we, we operate in an industry where our customers primarily are spending their discretionary funds every month on our services. And so when they don't have as much disposable income in their budget, guess what? we're going to be one of the first things they cut out if they don't see our services as being something that they can't live without. 
And that's a tough sell when you're teaching martial arts, you know, whether it's to children or adults. This all adds up to um, making it a really tough business environment for us. I'm not saying this to be all gloom and doom. I'm just saying that this is just the way it is now. So, you know, between recession, inflation, and the economic instability we have, because we have these disruptive economic events that are coming ever more often. It used to be that um, when I started off in business, we would see disruptive events happen about every 10 years. And uh, some of the disruptive events that I experienced, um, there was the dot-com bubble bursting, you know, which was a pretty disruptive event. And pretty close uh, after that, you know, we had uh, we had 9-11, you know, which was also, you know, it was kind of like that was a, an outlier event. And, you know, what's interesting is, is I think 9-11 was probably a, a pretty good indication that things were changing globally as far as um, the type of disruptive events we could see and how they would affect our economy globally due to globalism and due to interconnectedness of, uh, of economies worldwide, um, which was, you know, which has changed since the Industrial Revolution, since we moved into an information age. But, uh, you know, after that, we had the mortgage crisis, you know, went through that as a school owner. And, uh, you know, then we had the Great Recession and, you know, that followed the mortgage crisis and so forth. So we used to see those disruptive events about every 10 years. And then they started getting closer and closer together, you know, more like five years and then more like three or two. And now we're seeing disruptive events happen in our economy about every six months. And, uh, you know, additionally, I think as society, the way technology is moving, as quickly as technology is moving and how technology is integrated into society now, because we have mobile devices, we have smartphones, um, we have Wi-Fi everywhere, you know, um, people are relying on the Internet. They see the Internet is basically like a, uh, you know, almost like a public utility. Um, it's something, you know, all of our economy is intertwined with uh, Internet connectivity and uh, with digital media and so forth. Um, so much of our economy is driven by social media and not just our economy, but also um, the overall zeitgeist of the uh, of culture, you know, and civilization is uh, greatly impacted by what happens in digital media, social media and so forth. And because of that, I think that people on the whole society and culture are having difficulty. And it's not just my generation or, or you know, I'm I'm uh, Gen X, you know, uh, it's not just us, it's not just boomers. I think it's everybody. People are having a hard time keeping up with changes in technology and, uh, you know, especially in business because, I mean, things just move so fast and they change so quickly. And if you're not the, on the ball, if you're not staying on top of things, um, you know, you're going to get left behind. You're going to wake up one day and, and find that, you know, things that you did uh, even like, you know, 18 months or two years ago aren't working today in your business. And uh, you're going to be scrambling to fix it. And this is one of the reasons why, number one, you have to stay on top of uh, technological change and, uh, you know, technological innovation as a small studio owner. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert in everything, but you need to stay on top of it. You need to make sure you're hiring the right people to help you in those areas because you can't be an expert at everything. And uh, you need to understand the issues and um, be enough, I guess you could say, of a futurist to be able to see things coming, you know, that are that are coming at you um, before they become a problem. So between that and, uh, you know, these disruptive economic events, recession, inflation, instability, and then we have these dishonest thought leaders that are in our industry. And, you know, when I wrote Small Digit Big Profits um, some 20 years ago, I wrote it because I was upset, almost furious, and disappointed with the information that was uh, available in the industry at the time, the business information, because I felt like the people who were disseminating information on the whole, um, that they were they were doling out information that wasn't exactly in the favor of, of helping, you know, I guess you could say intended to help martial arts studio owners. You know, it was really information that was meant to influence studio owners to run their businesses in such a way to where it would benefit some of the um, the most influential businesses and personalities in the industry. And so I wrote Small to Big Profits is, is kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a bit, I guess you could say, of a um, manifesto against kind of the big school mentality. Uh, but then also I wanted to give martial arts instructors who enjoy teaching and uh, who wanted to run honest studios and run businesses honestly, wanted to give them an alternative, an alternative business model 
Um, it's the business model that I discovered worked best for me over the years, you know. Um, no one person taught it to me. I picked it up from multiple different sources and developed my own business model over time, and it's what worked well for me. So, you know, when I wrote that book, I thought, it, you know, after maybe 10 years, I guess, you know, um, I thought things had changed. And I thought that because of the fact that the consumer holds most of the power in the business to consumer relationship these days. And because you uh, studio owners are the consumer when it comes to uh, consuming uh, services, um, products, and so forth in the martial arts industry that are meant to assist you in running your business uh, more productively and more profitably, I thought we were beyond the era of thought leaders taking advantage of individual studio owners, and I was wrong. And that's one of the reasons why I'm back. Um, from everything from, you know, people who aren't martial artists being sold franchises and being told as franchisees that they can run a small martial arts studio as a semi-absentee owner business, you know, which I'm not going to get into that. I don't have to. The uh, news articles are out there. You can go, you know, look up the lawsuits and uh, you can easily find information online about that to consultants who are still telling their clients after all this time to do dishonest things in order to make a buck in their businesses. And I can tell you for a fact that um, you might be able to, to get, you know, to get rich, to make some money being dishonest. Eventually it's going to catch up to you. And honestly, some of those consultants that are out there that um, are telling people to do dishonest things in their business, some of that's already caught up to them. Some of them have had some major lawsuits that have disrupted their lives and, you know, they've already paid the price for, for their own dishonesty and their own lack of integrity. But um, they're trying to pass that along to people because, well, I, I don't know. I guess sociopaths are going to do what sociopaths do. Um, from that to consulting companies who are really essentially overcomplicating what is a very simple business. And, you know, the overcomplication of business systems and, uh, you know, business models, it's an old consultant's trick. It is um, a trick that consultants use in order to get more of your money. Because if a consultant can overcomplicate a problem and create complex solutions to simple problems, you will give them more of your money because it's going to take you more time and uh, effort to learn those complex systems. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, it's wrong. It's definitely borderline unethical to do that to a small business owner who's struggling to get by, you know, or at least maybe just struggling to learn the systems they need to make their business a success. And, you know, I've worked with thousands of martial arts school owners over the last 20 years. I've spoken with so many people. I've impacted so many people. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. I'm just saying it as a fact. And I know that most of you out there when you start your dojos, you're not able to get business loans. You're not going through the SBA. Um, you know, you're not trust fund babies or something like that. Most of you are starting your businesses with uh, money out of pocket. You're using your own capital. Um, some of you are tapping out your 401ks. Others of you, against uh, my advice, certainly, are, you know, starting your businesses on credit cards and so forth. But mostly... Um, you're investing everything you have into your studios and taking a gamble on a lifelong dream. And I think it's unethical for consultants, coaches, and so forth to take advantage of you and to tell you to do, you know, quite frankly, things that are not in your best interest um, so they can make a buck. I, you know, I, I just, I don't get it. So it's upsetting to me that this is happening and, uh, you know, these people that are out to take advantage of you, the independent studio owner, um, you know, hacks me off. So that's why I'm back, and I am back, and I'm going to be back for a while, um, you know, as long as I can. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm here to impact some lives, and so that's what we're going to do. Hopefully, you know, some of you out there will, uh, you know, my message will resonate with you. Some people who haven't heard of me before. And we'll do some amazing things together. That's what I'm looking forward to. Now, let's talk about our secondary topic for today's podcast, and that is choosing success. So 
like I said earlier, now that I'm back, I've started to increase the amount of content I put on the social media, and a few of my videos have, uh, yeah, they've got a little bit of viral success, gotten a little bit of viral success. And one of them recently, just the other day, was this Bob Proctor video. Some of you might know who Bob Proctor is. He might be before your time. Uh, Bob Proctor was a uh, personal development and success uh, coach. He wrote a couple of books. He was also involved in that book, The Secret, which I think is a bunch of hooey. I think, you know, the whole idea that you're going to manifest something, you know, by thinking about something, universe is going to gift it to you is, is a crock, you know. But, um, you know, Proctor, he, he had some he has some some good things to say. And so um, my social media team posted this uh, motivational clip of Bob Proctor talking about how, you know, uh, the average person and, uh, you know, a homeless person both have 24 hours in a day. And I, I get, some people got really upset about it. There were some comments on the video that were, some of them were funny, you know, and they were kind of tongue in cheek. Others, you know, people were really upset, but man, people really, really took um, umbrage at, uh, with that video. And so I thought it was kind of interesting because, you know, as I commented um, in response to some of the comments on the video, um, I myself was homeless for several months when I was younger. And I won't go into that story. Some of you already know it, but uh, it has to do with, you know, uh, being a young man, not yet being out of high school, getting kicked out of my house and making some bad choices and so forth. Uh, but, uh, you know, that kind of gives you an idea of where I started at when I started my first dojo, my first business. So, um, you know, between that and the fact that I've actually spent some time here in Austin where I live, going out and, you know, like it gets cold every year here in Austin around, uh, you know, late November, early December, you know, we get our first cold snap and Typically, there's a bunch of homeless people out there that aren't prepared for it because the weather's usually so nice out here. And we have people that freeze to death and so forth. So I've, I've spent time going out, passing out blankets, doing things like that, um, you know, food, things of that nature, you know, just warm, dry socks, stuff like that. And uh, I've also volunteered at one of the uh, homeless resource shelters downtown. And I worked at the Salvation Army, too, as well, doing security there when I first moved to Austin. That was one of the odd jobs I worked when I was trying to get my studio started. So I am familiar with the homeless population, and, and having spent considerable time with them, I can tell you that, you know, yes, there are people that are on the street that um, don't want to be there, and, uh, the, you know, they've just had one or two, you know, really bad things happen to them in their lives, and, like, most of the, uh, the population who are living just one or two paychecks away from poverty and homelessness. That's what happened to these people, you know, and I've, I've spoken with some people with some really, really hard luck stories. And then another portion of those homeless people are those who have really serious mental health issues and addiction issues. And uh, those stories are really sad. And I, here in Texas, at least, I think, you know, that we're failing them as a society. Um, but then I'd say roughly about a third of the people that I met and spoke with um, at homeless camps and so forth, you know, and, and shelters. Um, they were people that wanted to be homeless. And believe it or not, you know, it blew my mind. But uh, these people typically, what they told me was that they enjoyed the freedom it gave them. You know, not having to live by a clock, you know, not having to have a job, being able to go where they wanted, do what they wanted, anytime they wanted. And uh, that's just the way things are. So, you know, Bob Proctor, he might have promoted some hooey, but the message of the clip that he posted was basically that we choose what we what we do with our time. And we're all given the same amount of time. Everybody has the same amount of time allotted to them, more or less, you know, in a day is what he was saying. And uh, we get to choose what we do with our time. And uh, trust me, over the last couple of years, you know, dealing with a, a life-threatening cancer diagnosis, I have thought a lot about time and how we spend it. And, uh, you know, I agree with Pop Proctor in that, uh, in that regard, you know, we get to choose what we do with our time. And the fact that so many people commented on a random video on the internet just amazes me, you know, for one, you know, I operate under the philosophy that nothing that happens online is real. It's not real life, that it's not reality. It's, it's, um, internet reality, you know, it's virtual reality. And so I don't tend to get really worked up about things that happen online. And the fact that so many people do is just shocking to me because it, it makes me wonder, you know, if these people, if they're spending all of their time and energy, all their mental energy and all their focus, um, you know, drumming up moral outrage for things that don't really affect them personally and affect their own personal situation, you know, what's left for them, 
you know, what, how much energy, how much mental focus, you know, how, how much whatever drive is left for them to better their own situation. And I think in many cases, you know, these people, you know, which is pretty common among most people I've found, are more content to sit around and complain about their situation and complain about other things and blame problems, blame their problems, society's problems on somebody else rather than working to fix their own problems because it's easier to do so. Now, it was once said, um, you know, by, you know, I'd say somebody who was, uh, was a pretty bright person that as a man thanketh in his heart, so is he, right? And that's Proverbs 23, 7. And if you want to know more about that philosophy, go pick up James Allen's book. Um, it was written in 1903 called As a Man Thinketh. It's a classic book. It's actually in the, in the uh, um, public realm right now. And uh, so you can get that book for free probably on Amazon. You could probably find it online anywhere, but I recommend you read it. Basically what Alan was saying, um, kind of riffing on what the, um, uh, the uh, author of Proverbs said, is that the things that you dwell on, the things that you think about all the time, and the things that you dwell on are going to impact the person you are and they're going to impact your life, okay? Now, that's a little bit different from saying that if you think about something, you can manifest success in your life. Um, that's a crock of horse hockey. Uh, you know, you're not going to manifest anything. The universe isn't going to gift you with something just because you thought about it. But um, your attitude or the things you think about are going to impact your attitude. And your attitude is going to impact your ability to succeed. So if you want to succeed, in my opinion and in my experience, you have to become obsessed with success. Success has to be something that you think about constantly. And you have to think about your goals constantly. And you have to do that to the exclusion of almost all distractions. Save for a few, you know, because... We don't want to trade a healthy marriage or a healthy family for a healthy dojo, right? A financially healthy dojo. That's a, that's a pretty poor trade in my opinion. Um, you can't have both, trust me. You know, you can have a healthy family, healthy marriage relationship, and also have a healthy dojo. You just have to balance things. And, and on your rise to success, you know, you have to make sure that, you, um, that your family is in tune with your goals and the sacrifices that you have to make to get there and that, they all, and that you understand and they understand that that's a temporary situation. But clearing your life of distractions is probably the best way to be able to focus your energy on what matters, what counts. Because, you know, there's a Japanese proverb that says the hunter who chases two rabbits will catch neither. It's very, very true. When I started my first studio, I had failed three times prior to that, you know, partially from lack of knowledge, partially from lack of information, but then also... Um, simply because, you know, I, I lack focus and I gave up too easily. And I finally realized when I had no other choice, no other choice but to succeed, you know, or to be a laughing stock. Because when I came to Austin, Texas, you know, people had, you know, people in my life had said um, that I was going to be a failure. I could make money teaching martial arts, on and on. Some of that stuff's in my book, Small Those Are Big Profits, if you want to pick it up and read it. But, uh, but I, I chose you know, that there was, you know, there was no choice for me. I was going to succeed no matter what. I was going to live my dream. I was going to teach martial arts for a living and I was going to make it my career. And I did succeed against um, pretty significant odds. But I did that by removing all extraneous distractions from my life. I didn't have serious relationships for several years. Um, I didn't drive new cars. I reinvested all the money that I made on my jobs, and I worked some pretty long hours, too, in addition to running my dojo. Um, I reinvested all my money I could back in my business. You know, I'd, I'd lived in, you know, like little, like a little 12 by 20 efficiency that was like an old, uh, it was the ROTC uh, dorms, you know, for the University of Texas is what the building had been, and somebody had converted it into um, – efficiency apartments for college students. And I just happened to get in there, even though I wasn't a college student, because I knew somebody there. And, you know, I had a hot plate and a little dorm refrigerator and a bed. And I shared a bathroom with the guy next door who happened to be one of my coworkers at the security company I worked at. So, you know, I worked, you know, 50, 60 hour weeks, and I would work, you know, 10 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and then I would drive 45 minutes to an hour to the dojo. And I would work for three or four hours, and then about 11 o'clock at night, you know, I would drive back home 45 minutes to an hour, get a little bit of sleep, and then wake up to do it all again. And so, you know, I made sacrifices, and I didn't let anything distract me, and that's why I was successful. We have to do the same thing. We have to not let extraneous things and, 
and uh, you know, insignificant things distract us from our goals, and that's that's how you choose success. You know, and the thing is, I see people complaining about about society, especially, and I'm not knocking any particular generation, okay, but I do happen to see younger people complain, and um, you know, some of it's some of it I will say is warranted, but a lot of it's not. But they complain that. They don't have the same opportunities that their parents had, you know, that it was much easier for their parents, you know, with no college education to work a single job, uh, be a single income family and still have, you know, a uh, own a house, you know, drive new cars, have a lifestyle that is, uh, you know, what used to be considered middle class. Now it's really considered to be almost an upper middle class lifestyle to live that way. But, um, you know, I, I, I see and hear people complaining like that a lot and you know, I don't know. I mean, in some sense, I, I agree. It is more difficult not to own a house because interest rates are higher, you know. Um, after the mortgage crisis, it's harder to get loans, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, I will also say that there's never been so much opportunity. I mean, the digital age, you know, living in an information age and the Internet um, and information technology just made it so incredibly. I mean, there's just so many opportunities out there. You know, if, for example, you can get a college education for free or nearly free online now. Uh, not only are there schools, now they may not be accredited schools, but there are schools where you can get the equivalent education to, say, an Ivy League ed education um, for a few hundred dollars, you know. Um, you can hack a college degree now very easily by using um, websites like Straighter Line, Sophia, um, Study.com, and so forth, and you could take numerous, numerous college classes, the equivalent of college classes, for you know 40, 50 bucks a month or something like that, 99 bucks a month, and then transfer that credit into accredited universities and you know hack, gosh, you know 90 credits of a 120 credit college degree. You can spend less than 100 dollars a month, 50 dollars a month in some cases, or even free in other cases. Um, as far as tuition goes, to learn how to code. You can learn how to code yourself. I know of an individual, he's actually a fiction author now, but um, he was living in relative poverty. You know, he was, uh, um, this is his story. You know, I'm not going to say the guy's name, but uh, he's a good guy. But uh, this gentleman was living in poverty. He had a, several roommates that he was living with. They were all potheads. He said, you know, by of his own um, account that he was sitting around smoking pot all day and working in a bank and a job he hated and so forth. And he just woke up one day and said, you know what, I hate this. And what did the guy do? He spent all his spare time teaching himself how to write um, basically Apple apps, you know, um, apps in uh, iOS, you know, iOS, and uh, developed a uh, $100,000 a year, $100,000 a year skill just by studying on his own. He taught himself, you know, he took classes online, but essentially he taught himself. And raised himself out of poverty that way. And then later on, you know, he was able to, to write his first fiction novel and became a successful fiction author. But it's a perfect example of the fact that, again, we all have 24 hours in every day. And we, we can choose how we, how we spend that time. We can choose to spend that time on the Internet, making comments about random videos and, you know, complaining about the, you know, state of the economy or how it's impacting us and, how, you know, our particular generation, you know, has it so much harder than the generations that came previously and whatnot. Um, we can choose to spend our time sitting around drinking and, you know, uh, you know, doing recreational drugs and zoning out in front of the boob tube and watching Netflix or, you know, whatever streaming service you prefer. Or we can cut all that extraneous stuff out of our life and focus on achieving a goal. Whether it's starting a martial arts school or getting a degree or learning a hundred thousand dollar a year skill, it doesn't matter. What matters is is that you choose success, that you stop making excuses for yourself, you stop making excuses for your own failures, you stop making excuses for your own inability to change, for your own inflexibility of thinking, and you decide that you are going to choose success for yourself. And that you're going to cut out everything extraneous in your life except for the effort and the time that is necessary to achieve your goal. And once you do, 
you know, chances are good. You're going to stack the odds in your favor. Chances are good. You're going to succeed. Nothing's guaranteed. You might not, you might fall flat in your face. Like I did many times before you succeed, but keep trying. Eventually you're going to meet with some success and you can use every little success as a building block, just like Legos. You can build bit by bit and eventually build the life of your dreams. So opportunities everywhere. I'm encouraging you to choose success. Now go out there and kill it. And I will see you in the next episode of the podcast.